There is a lot of excitement in the World Cup so far, but I know you have been wondering where is the greatest player of all time. Magnus Carlsen joins the event in round two. Like all the top 25 players, they were free in the first round. They didn't have to face a weaker opponent. And in this second round, Magnus is playing against an experienced grandmaster from Georgia. His name is Levan Pansulaya. And in the first game of the mini match, Magnus managed to grind out a queen end game, winning with the black pieces. But we are going to have a look at his white game against the same player. And Magnus is, of course, uh, the huge favorite. And black Pansulaya needs to play for a win. And let's see what happens. It's going to be a lot of fun as well. White opens the game with one c4, English opening, c5, symmetrical variation, knight f3, g6, d4. And now, of course, if you do take on d4, knight takes d4, we may get some sort of Maroxi bind type of structure when white gets pawns on e4 and c4. But black goes for the move, bishop g7. Taking the pawn is not that dangerous. Black can easily regain that pawn in, in different ways. So the Thematical way of playing here is d5, advancing the pawn, grabbing space, and in general these sort of positions are somewhat more pleasant for white because of that space advantage, black's position is quite uh, cramped. d6, e4, occupying the full center, e6, h3, and of course there are possibilities to take on d5 and uh, you can choose how to recapture either with the c pawn or with the E pawn in both cases, white's position is more pleasant. Anyway, black goes for some sort of Benoni kind of a structure, but not with a knight on its standard square f6. But Pansulaya brings it out to uh, to e7, knight c3, and now the move h6 was played. Both sides making kind of subtle waiting moves for white. This move h3 was probably designed against uh, ideas based on bishop g4, maybe black. Once at some point play the move g5, who knows, the knight can come over to g6. Very subtle pawn play by both sides. And here the question is, what is white going to do? There have been just a very few games in this exact position. Uh, Boris Gelfand played here once the move bishop d3, maintaining the pawn on d5. But Magnus has a different approach and decides to take on e6. So that after bishop takes e6, now the bishop can be developed. So that's the main advantage for black. The drawback though is that the bishop from c1 comes to f4 and white is pressurizing this backward pawn on d6. But this is all according to plan. Black is basically saying, okay, you're allowed to, uh, to take that pawn. I'm looking for peace activity. So he brings out the knight to c6. So in certain cases, the knight is eyeing for the um, d4 square. White captures the pawn. This is the principled uh, movement. Of course, swapping queens would make uh, white's life much easier, but Pansulaya has a different idea. Brings out the queen to a5, intending to take on c3 twice when the king on e1 and the rook on a1 will be hanging in the end. So white quickly drops back with the queen. Queen has done its job. White is a pawn up. But now black does get some sort of small initiative with its uh, pieces. Has a lot of interesting moves to uh, gain tempos. For instance, rook d8 attacking the queen. But then white's plan is to play knight d5. This is kind of neutralizing all black's uh, play. Queens can come off the board and there is no possibility of regaining the pawn by taking on b2 because of rook b1 after the bishop moves the pawn on b7 drops. So that is White's idea that with the queen on d2, you're unpinning the knight and you're ready to play here the move knight e5. And therefore, knight b4 is played. This is a strange looking move. You may think, what is that knight doing there? Well, if knight e5 is played now, there is knight c2 and you do have a huge knight fork. The knight cannot be taken as the queen is pinned. Now you understand Pansulaya's idea. And Magnus says, okay, your knight... What's doing there? I want to kick it out. So he played here the move a3. It should be said though that starting with rook d1 also makes sense. I will show you why. Because after the move a3, you're not really threatening to take the knight yet, of course. Because not, uh, rook on a1 is hanging. So the game continues. Black does have some time. Played here the move g5, attacking the bishop. The bishop had to has to go somewhere. 
went to h2, staying on, uh, on this diagonal, covering some dark squares. And now the move rook d8 is played, attacking the queen. And obviously, if we go back one move, if you would have started with rook d1, that idea with rook d8 is never really a possibility because you can just swap the queens and black doesn't have sufficient compensation for the, um, for the pawn. And of course, if you think you can take the pawn on a2 because the rook is no longer defending the pawn on a2, there is rook a1 and that knight is pinned. Black is losing material in that case. So therefore, rook d1 would have been more precise, small, inaccurate decision by Magnus Carlsen. Let's get back to the game. As after rook d8, black does get a bit of play here. Queen c1. And the question is, what are you going to do with the knight? Because the queen is protecting the rook now. A takes b4 is a threat. Are you going back with your knight? That is one way of playing it. I think after bishop e2, it's not really clear what black is going to do. Although, apparently a move like bishop takes c3, I think this is a difficult move to, to spot. Uh, you don't really often want to give up your dark squared bishop that fast. But after b takes c3, knight d4 is a really cool move, exploiting the fact that the pawn on c3 is pinned. You're threatening knight b3 with a knight fork. And if you do take on d4, c takes d4, you're going to regain the pawn by taking on, uh, on c3 next. Interesting line, probably the game is more or less even, but Pansulaya, in my opinion, goes for an interesting move, maybe not the best idea, because he plays knight d3, tempting move, it's a knight fork, but by giving up your bishop for the knight, white is all of a sudden able to get its king out of the center, so his development accelerates now, castling king side, and bishop takes c4, black has won its pawn back. But his king is still in the center. You would think, okay, the, the rook is uh, looking a bit uh, not really nice on, uh, on f1, standing in the line of the bishop. So you may consider moving the knight. But here, Magnus changes the course of the game. He was a pawn up, fighting against black's small initiative. But now he plays the move knight d5, attacking the bishop on c4. So after knight takes d5, rather than taking on d5, you take on c4 when both the rook and the knight are hanging. So that means white wins a piece. Bishop takes d5 is the only move. E takes d5. And now the rook looks a bit, uh, bit clumsy. Once again, if, uh, if you take with a knight, queen c4 is there. Things are not looking very nice here for, uh, for black. So you got to do something about this pawn. Because if you get your king out of the center now, there is the move d6. And now we see how useful that bishop is on h2. The passed pawn is dominating the board. It does attack the knight. And it will not be easy for black at all to, uh, to generate some counterplay. And keep in mind, black is in a must-win situation. So black has not much of a choice. Captures the pawn. So two moves ago, black was a pawn down. Now he is a pawn up. But Magnus played here the move rook e1. Pinning that knight on e7. The knight cannot move while the king can also not really leave the center because then the knight is um, is hanging. Queen d8 played, so the queen comes back into defense to help the uh, knight. So black is threatening to castle, but Magnus is fighting for the initiative with another excellent move. Played here the move queen c4, staying in touch with the rook, so that if you castle, there is the deflection motive of rook takes e7 and the queen cannot protect both the knight and the uh, and the rook on d5. After queen takes e7, queen takes d5, white is, uh, is a full piece up. Therefore, there's an emergency situation. You need to do something about that uh, pin, otherwise your king is badly placed. The rook on h8 remains out of play. So king f8 played. And the question is, how is white going to prove its compensation? There are various ideas, including to double rooks on the e-file. That's a move I like a lot. But Magnus' move also causes a lot of practical problems as he went for the move knight e5. And the idea here is that uh, the knight is fantastically placed in the center. Black never really wants to take it uh, with its bishop because then you give up your, uh, your control over the dark squares and the bishop from uh, h2 comes into the game. So Black goes here for the move knight c6 
aiming for the exchange of pieces, attacking the knight on uh, e5. Three times, it's only twice defended, so you would expect white here to make a move with its knight. But Magnus has different ideas. Place here the move rook a d1. Attacking the rook on d5, and the point is now that after rook takes d1, white doesn't have to recapture, of course. But there is the move queen takes f7, and we see that the knight on e5, together with the queen, can set up a mating threat against the king. So therefore, no time to take on e5. Black's idea instead is to plump its knight on, um, on d4. So the d-file remains closed for the moment. Everything is under control and who knows, maybe at some point, or not now actually, um, there are sometimes possible discovered checks with a knight after the rook on d1 may be hanging. But we have already seen that at this point, the rook on d5 cannot move because of the mating threat. But things can change easily in the position. Magnus, typical, typically he thought, okay, there are a lot of interesting moves, but his move so subtle it's uh, it's king h1 it's not like you're threatening just uh, anything it's just anticipating prophylactical move your opponent's um, potential discovered uh, attack idea so the king is looking straight strange on h1 but there are not that many good moves here and pansulaya wanted to play it very actively played here the move b5 to attack the queen but i should also point out that black is not in, in great shape. Practically, he's playing without that rook on h8. And in order to get it back into the game, black has to play here this move, h5. And the idea is that uh, you're trying to get your rook into the game via, via h6, and uh, maybe rook e6 can be played at, uh, at some point as well, attacking the knight on, uh, on e5. And okay, if black survives, he is a pawn up. But this didn't happen in the game, but you can imagine that White will also sense the uh, the urgency here that he needs to act right now. And probably a move like b4 would have been played with the idea to undermine the pawn on c5. You can never take on b4 because then the knight on d4 will be taken after rook takes d4. We have the same mating pattern again. This is an incredibly sharp position and no matter what the engines are saying, Anything can happen here. And this is practically, I think, easier to handle with white. It's always nicer to be on the side with the initiative than to defend against it. In the game, there followed b5. It's an also an interesting move, but we get to see the drawback very soon. You're attacking the queen. Queen goes back to d3. And only now the move h5 was played. But with this insertion of uh, the moves uh, b5 and queen d3, now white does get the possibility to play here knight c6, attacking the queen, making use of the knight being pinned. After knight takes c6, it's queen takes d5, and white does win the exchange. Well, that's not possible. The queen got to move. The queen went to b6, so you, uh, you maintain control over that knight on d4, but white is not really interested in taking the knight. Look what's happening here. Knight e7, the knight is dancing inside black's position. It's protected by the rook, no chance for black to take it. Knight takes d5 is the threat. The rook got a move, it went back to d8. It's the safest uh, square for the rook to go to. And now the knight comes to f5. Excellent move, we're trying to take advantage of the weaknesses on black's king side. And still, the king is in trouble in the sense that the rooks are not connected yet. And with it, knight on f5, Black is no longer able to activate its rook via h6. Also, knight takes f5 is not possible because of queen takes d8. Queen takes and then its rook takes d8 with checkmate as the other rook prevents the king from getting back to the center to e7. What should black do? It's, it's a very difficult position. Probably a move like bishop f6, trying to hold on to your position. But after bishop e5, white still step by step increases the pressure trying to Trade of the bishop, if you trade it, the rook comes into to e5. Practically still very difficult to, to play, but this didn't happen at all. Instead, Ponsulaya played here the move queen g6, and I think it's a very understandable move, but it's not a good one. Look, the idea is that if you're going to take on g7 now as white, getting that bishop, there is queen takes d3. Queens come off the board and black is happy to play this endgame with an extra pawn. It's probably not even better, but 
queens are off the board and that's what black really wants but because of queen g6 the other side of the board is more vulnerable and magnus spots a beautiful tactical motive he played here the move bishop c7 attacking the rook you gotta do something about a rook where's the rook going if it goes to c8 to attack the bishop it's bishop d6 with check that's the idea that we have deflected the rook has been for forced to leave the d-file after king g8 only move for the king it's knight e7 with a knight fork you're winning the queen therefore the move rook d7 was played so the rook attacks the bishop from a different angle and still retains control over the d6 square if the bishop goes there you can capture twice with the rook and then with the queen but can you see what is the key move here for white this was definitely overlooked by Pansulaya. this is your chance to follow the footsteps of magnus calls and he has a brilliant shot and one two three let's see what happened rook e8 brilliant shot it's only possible now the rook has left the back rank Pansulaya was staring what what is happening here i didn't see this move at all king takes e8 queen e4 check with the idea that if you go with your king back to f8 it's queen a8 and it's going to be checkmate as the knight once again prevents the king from coming to e7 this is checkmate the only other move here would be knight e6 blocking with the knight but now queen a8 can be played once again here we see what is the problem when one rook is not on the back rank and the other one is still on its initial square the king is in the middle that rook on h8 doesn't cover the back rank you've got to block with your knight and magnus had calculated there is queen takes d8 rook takes d8 rook takes d8 with the rook and queen sacrifice we have this mating pattern unfortunately pansulaya didn't give the former world champion the chance to execute it on the board after the move rook e8 black resigned and magnus wins his first mini match 2-0 very convincingly and we will get to see what he is going to do in the third round this was absolutely exciting great attacking game by magnus Carlsen. i hope you liked it thanks for watching subscribe to the channel and very soon much more coverage of this fantastic event